an initiative of Providence College Humanities Program. And our goal, of course, as you all know, is to encourage engagement with the humanities core outside of regular class time. It's a time for you, uh, especially those uh, students, to get to know your, uh, your professors a little bit better and to meet um, other faculty and speakers from other areas. Um, as you all know, we have almost every Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock a lecture here in Siena, one, uh, Siena sorry, <laughs> Ruane 105, uh, followed by a reception. We hope that uh, you will be able to stay for the entire lecture today, uh, and please join us afterwards for the reception. So at this point, I'm going to pass this off to uh, Dr. Arthur Urbano, a member of the theology department, to introduce our guest, uh, Dr. Susan Harvey, today. Good afternoon, everyone. Good cold, frigid Friday afternoon. Uh, thanks for coming out today. Um, I'm Arthur Urbano from the Theology Department. Uh, and it's a real honor and pleasure for me today to um, introduce our, our speaker, uh, Professor Susan Ashbrook Harvey uh, from Brown University. Uh, Professor Harvey is Royce Family Professor of Teaching Excellence and the Willard Prescott and Annie McClellan Smith Professor of History and Religion uh, in the Religious Studies Department at Brown. She completed her doctorate at the Center of Byzantine Studies at the University of Bingham, Birm oh, sorry, Birmingham. Uh, her area of expertise is late antique and Byzantine Christianity, focusing on uh, Syriac Christianity. She has authored and co-authored several books, uh, including Song and Memory, Biblical Women in Syriac Tradition, Scenting Salvation, Ancient, His Ancient Christianity and the Olfactory Imagination, and Asceticism and Society in Crisis, John of Ephesus, and the Lives of the Eastern Saints. Uh, in addition to her scholarship, Professor Harvey has been engaged in robust theological and ecumenical work. She just recently returned from Romania, where she participated in a conference of the International Orthodox Theological Society on Women in the Orthodox Church. And from 1992 to 2017, she was appointed by the Assembly of Orthodox Bishops to the Roman Catholic Eastern Orthodox Bilateral Consultation in North America. A member of the Antiochian Orthodox Church, Professor Harvey is a liturgical cantor and director of her parish choir. And we've talked about these, these struggles of, of, of having that kind of responsibility. Um, on a personal note, I'd, I'd just like uh, to say that uh, Susan has been a, uh, a mentor, colleague, and friend of mine for, for many years. Uh, I won't say how many, uh, but a few years ago when I was a, a freshman uh, at Brown University, I took her course, uh, Christianity in Late Antiquity, uh, and, that co and that course uh, just planted a seed for me that uh, years later would uh, sort of sprout into my returning to work with her uh, in my, uh, my doctoral program. So I'm very grateful to her for all of her guidance and inspiration all of, uh, over all of these years, and uh, just happy to welcome her to Providence College today. So, Professor Susan Ashbrook Harvey. Thank you, Professor Urbano. It's really, is that right? That's good? It's really a pleasure to be able to say Professor Urbano <laughs> to someone I knew when he was a first year. So, let, th is this all right? Yeah. This is okay? Okay. I'll stay close. Uh, thank you all for coming out on a Friday afternoon. I know that's a lot to ask. Um, even my own students would also uh, resist such an effort. Um, and it's really an honor to be here for your Humanities Forum. Thank you. This afternoon, I would like to talk about the voices uh, of ancient Syriac Christian worship. So we can start with, whom do I mean by this term, Syriac Christians? These are Christians for whom Syriac was their language. This is what Syriac looks like. This is a century manuscript page from the book of Genesis in the Old Testament. Um, Syriac is a dialect of Aramaic, which is the language that Jesus spoke. Speakers of Syriac will always tell you that. This is the language that Jesus spoke. And for many Christians of the Middle East, uh, since the first century, Syriac was their language and continues to be their language now of worship and sometimes also their spoken language in its different modern uh, dialects to the present day. 
So the churches that use this language now are churches that cross between the Orthodox and the Roman Catholic uh, polities. So you may have heard of some of these, the Assyrian Church of the East, the Chaldean Catholic, the Malankara Orthodox, the Maronites, the Syriac Catholics, the Syriac Orthodox, the Syro-Malabar Catholic, and the Syro-Malankara Catholic traditions. So I'm going to be talking, my uh, comments today are going to be focused between the 4th and 6th century, although that won't matter, you don't even have to pay attention to that, um, before those names were in place. But the tradition represented by the uh, poets I'm going to be talking about is a living one in these different um, communions. And I brought some pictures to help orient you, so we all know what we're talking about. This is what Syriac looks like. You write it right to left, the way you would write Hebrew or Arabic. And here's the map where we are today, <laughs> um, a former map of Syria. And Syriac began as a dialect actually around this, this little area. And it's an interesting thing. This is an ancient map. Uh, it began here at the city of Edessa. Syriac was the dialogue, dialect spoken by Christians as opposed to the Greek that was spoken by pagans or the Aramaic that was spoken by Jews or the Persian that was spoken by Zoroastrians. Syriac was the language of Christians. It began as a dialect here. It spread throughout the Middle East. Very, it began in the first century. It spread very quickly throughout the Middle East. Um, in the ancient world, through the Roman Empire in its eastern part here, and through the Persian Empire, and it would spread to India, and then it would spread on into Central Asia and to China by the 7th century. So here we have um, some examples of Syriac families around the time period that I'm going to be talking about in my comments. You have to look at the women. I'm going to talk about women's choirs. I always think the fabulous ladies of Edessa. You can see that their artwork, um, if you've looked at Roman art or even uh, some Persian art from antiquity, looks a little bit like this, but also this is very distinctively their own. So these are, these are people who lived within other larger, more powerful cultures, the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire, um, eventually then they will be under Islam until the present day. They are minorities wherever they've lived. But they have their own style, their own um, brilliance, aesthetically, poetically, artistically, that they're still famous for. Uh, as I say, by the 7th century, their missionaries reached China. And I understand there's, um, in this room, people interested in this. We have a, a stele that records for us their arrival of their missionaries. And there's wonderful evidence coming out now from China that combines um, Christian iconography. So if you have a cross, you know that somehow it involves Christians with also Buddhist. Well, I know this is sideways if you're the Chinese speaker, but the Syriac runs this way. And it just depends which language on it you want to be following. It's a wonderful inscription about the, the teachings of the missionaries. By the seventh century, so we're seven, eight centuries before earlier than the Jesuit missionaries arrived. And this is a, a Christian community that would thrive through those centuries, and it survives. Um, but here, here's a good example of what happened in China. So you have a very uh, traditional kind of Buddhist iconography, but there's a cross here and a cross here. And probably we're looking at a, a bishop uh, giving his blessing. But the time period I'm going to be talking about, late antiquity, these are the cities of, uh, where Syriac is spoken in the Roman Empire. They were cities of wide colonnaded streets. They were prosperous. They had fabulous temples and theaters. They were pretty wealthy. They had wonderful um, public arts. And Syriac Christians in antiquity and still, and in Rhode Island, are famous for being jewelers who work very... Um, did their very wonderful work with gold and silver. These for the liturgy, beautiful chalice from Antioch. Sometimes these turn up in art exhibits like the Metropolitan Museum, but you know, beautiful liturgical instruments here, the censer, the uh, strainer for the wine. Uh, this bird should be attached to the incense bowls here and the chalices. 
Syriac manuscripts are uh, much older than Greek or Latin ones. The earliest uh, Syriac manuscript dates to the year 410, some centuries earlier than Greek or Latin, and they're beautifully um, illumined uh, with different kinds of artistic traditions. So here you have the uh, Feast of the Ascension, so Christ being taken up by the winged cherubim and seraphim, the Virgin Mary looking very peaceful and grand while the disciples look very lost and afraid. Um, Syriac artists flourished under Islam. This is a 12th century manuscript, um, the uh, Palm Sunday, the entry into Jerusalem, and it shows some influence from Islamic artists, but again, their own distinctive style. This is actually my favorite image. Do you know what this is? You recognize it? The wedding feast at Cana. So here's Jesus sitting with his mother at Cana at the wedding feast, and look, the wine is empty, right? So down here, we're going to have the changing of the water, the blue water, into red wine. But look, there's, their chairs are chalices. Is that just the coolest? Here's Jesus and Mary standing in their chalices. That little line of blue water as it's turning into the red wine, and we have this happy, happy drinker here. Uh, but these are the ladies of Edessa again. These are, I'm going to be talking about women's choirs, and these are the women we're talking about. And over our shoulder, we have um, St. Ephraim, the Syrian, who is a universal saint of the church, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Syriac Orthodox. He belongs to um, the whole of the universal church. And so he's going to be guiding a lot of my comments. But I'm going to, I like this image a lot, so I'm going to stand under this image. Okay, in what follows, well, let me try this. In the first centuries of Christianity as now, many voices comprised the liturgy. For every person present was a participant. In the ancient Syriac churches, so now you can do the, uh, you're, you might start this by asking what on earth I'm going to describe that is in any way different from what you yourselves always participate in. But that's part of my goal, is to get you to see things you don't normally think about. In ancient Syriac churches, we have present and participating in liturgies bishops, priests, deacons, subdeacons, chanters, choirs, consecrated virgins, blessed widows, monks, nuns, and laity in all of their ranks, all contributed their voices to the liturgy. Singing, chanting, intoning, proclaiming, teaching, responding, praying, confessing, supplicating, and glorifying. As we know from the worship in our own times, these voices surely sang with harmony and rich musical expression. I speak as a choir director here. In what follows, I want to ask about the meaning, the purpose, the work that voices do in liturgy. And by this I mean liturgy in its largest sense not only the mass or the divine liturgy of Sunday mornings, but the entire web of services that might constitute the life of a worshiping community. How were the different voices of liturgy sounded and heard? How and why were they valued? How was gender a component? And with what authority? What did the how did the context of liturgical performance contribute to the meaning of the sound of voices. I will argue that for ancient Syriac Christians, liturgical voices carried ethical and epistemological significance. That is, voices in liturgy could transform you as a person, could transform what you knew and understood about God and about humanity, and could transform the community as a whole. This is the work that voices could do in liturgy. So one thing that we know about the early Christians is that they sang. Hymns and poetic prayers are embedded throughout New Testament writings as are references to singing when gathered in worship. You know, St. Paul says, bring, somebody bring a hymn, somebody brings a reading. Whether Jesus with his disciples at the Last Supper, or Paul and Silas in prison, or the letters of Paul to different churches, or the visions of the life to come in the book of Revelation. All of these are places where the singing of Christians is referred to. 
In the letter to the Colossians, the faithful are exhorted, I quote, sing, to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So the singing was there from the start. Perhaps no one celebrated the sounding song of Christian worship like the 4th century hymn writer, St. Ephraim the Syrian, who died in the year 373. He's listed at the top of your handout. In his hymns for Christmas, Ephraim rejoiced that Nativity was a feast inviting every voice throughout the created order above and below to offer its joy. Humankind, angelic hosts, earth and heaven should all join their songs. I quote, and this is number one on the hand. We have some other handouts that people need. This is number one. O people, sing praise on the feast, the firstborn of all feasts. Unveil, make joyful your face, O creation, on our feast. Sing, O church, with a voice. Heaven and earth sing in silence. Sing and confess the child who brought manumission for all. Come, all you mouths, pour out and become a type of water and wells of voices. Let the spirit of truth come. Let her sing praise in all of us to the Father who redeemed us by his child. In Ephraim's hymns, the voices of heavenly worshipers thundered out, inviting and eliciting the voices of earthly ones. In performance, this dialogue, this is a dialogue, of singers calling others to sing. And this echoed the manner of hymnic exchange. For Ephraim's verses were always punctuated in each hymn by the short, repeated refrains that the congregation would offer in response. In another hymn on the Nativity, for example, Ephraim described those who sang forth in church at Christ's birth. I quote, all of creation became mouths and cried out to him. To which the congregation replied, I quote, praise to you, son of the Most High, who put on our body. So you have a dialogue between the congregation and the choir. Ephraim delighted to name the voices that sang in festal praise, voices of the heavenly hosts, the natural world, and of people. Among his favorites were those of the virgin women's choirs who performed his hymns. For example, in, in another hymn on the Nativity, and this one is number two on your handout, he sang, Let chaste women praise that pure Mary, since in their mother Eve their disgrace was great. Behold in Mary their sister, their triumph was magnified. Blessed is he who shone forth from them. And then the refrain from the congregation, most blessed of all is he by his birth. Syriac churches were distinctive in the early Christian world for having women's liturgical choirs. These were not choirs of nuns. They were consecrated, but they were not nuns. And they were assigned to civic churches, towns, villages, and cities. Every uh, church had to have a women's choir, according to Syriac canon law. Syriac tradition held that Ephraim himself had established the practice of these choirs, and certainly his hymns celebrated their singing as a notable part of liturgy. His verses granted female voices a prominence both of sound and of content. So now you have to think about this. What they were singing mattered, but the sound of women's voices mattered. For naming liturgical voices was a way of indicating their worth. In his second hymn on the resurrection, Ephraim exclaimed, this is number three, this joyful festival, Pascha, uh, Easter, is entirely made up of tongues and voices, innocent young men and women sounding like trumpets and horns, while infant girls and boys resemble harps and lyres, their, faces their voices intertwine as they reach up together towards heaven, giving glory to the Lord of glory. And then the refrain, blessed is he for whom the silent have thundered out. In the verse to follow, and I, this will be number four, Ephraim celebrates the Paschal Feast as a crown of flowers woven by the voices of each participant. He names them in turn, bishop, priests, deacons, young men, children, the women's choir, leading citizens, and ordinary folk. As the refrain implied, in the refrain, blessed is he for whom the silent have thundered out. 
Liturgy provided an occasion and a context in which voices often silent elsewhere sounded out with power. For Ephraim, each voice had a distinct contribution. Ritual context enabled these voices to sound and to be heard. It held them in high relief. It bestowed worth on their offering. Ephraim also emphasized the different voices of liturgy through his technique of presenting biblical characters in his hymns. Just as he sometimes drew attention to the singing of the women's choirs, his hymns often highlighted different women from the Bible in ways that resonated with what was happening in the liturgy itself. In his hymns on virginity, for example, he praised a number of New Testament women who met Jesus during his ministry, and you will have heard of these, the Canaanite woman, the Samaritan woman, the hemorrhaging woman who touched the hem of his garment, the paralytic woman who had been bent over for 18 years, Martha and Mary of Bethany, the sinful woman, and more. There were many who met Jesus, and he names them all. Ephraim's hymns present these biblical characters as women who most often approach Jesus in public. And then these are the, the verbs that Ephraim will use. These are women who approach Jesus by shouting their needs, by calling out with a loud voice, by thundering, by bellowing, unashamed, with a loud, with bold voice. So I'm quoting here. And so Ephraim in one of his hymns, this is not on your handout, sings out to Martha, Blessed are you, Martha. Blessed is your mouth that sounded forth with love. Now, if you look at the story of Martha in Luke 10, you know Martha went to Jesus to complain. I, you know, Jesus rebuked her. Here's Ephraim. Blessed are you, Martha. Blessed is your mouth for thundering forth. Or to the woman who called out from the crowd in Luke 11, you may remember there's a woman who calls out to Jesus, blessed is the one who bore you. Jesus rebukes her. Ephraim says, blessed are you, woman, whose voice became a trumpet among the silent. Again, Ephraim plays the, pray, uh, praised the Canaanite woman and as one whose love bellowed out. Another woman whom Jesus rebukes in the gospel. Who are you? You're a Canaanite. You know, she says, I'll take the crumbs from your table. Ephraim says, blessed are you whose voice bellowed forth. The Samaritan woman who met Jesus at the well in John chapter 4, Ephraim sang as one who spoke to Jesus perceptively, modest, yet her head was held high and her voice was authoritative. These characterizations of the voices of biblical women had their counterpart in the voices of the women's choirs who sang these hymns. For other Syriac writers in other places characterized the voices of the women's choirs in exactly these same terms. Their voices are described as loud, bold, instructive, wise, modest, and authoritative. In the case of the Virgin Mary, this connection is made even sharper, since Ephraim cast a number of his hymns as lullabies sung by Mary to her newborn son. Some Christmas carols you sing are also in that form of a lullaby that Mary sings to her newborn. Ephraim's hymns were performed by women's choirs, and singing in, in Mary's voice in the first person would cause Mary's voice to ring out from the imagined biblical past and into the concrete liturgical present, a vibrant, resounding presence amidst the gathered church as they joined in their responsive refrains. So you have a joining of biblical time with present time. Such joining of biblical and liturgical voices opened visibility on members of the civic community not often seen or heard in historical sources. And not only the women. In Ephraim's nativity hymns, for example, Mary sings her wonder at God's choice. For she and Joseph are poor. And Jesus was born in the dirt squalor of a cave. In Mary's imagined voice, the choir, the women's choir, sang, and this is number five on your sheet. 
Because of you, O Christ, a daughter of the poor is envied. Because of you, a daughter of the weak is the object of jealousy. Who gave you to me? Son of the rich one who despised the womb of rich women, what drew you toward the poor? For Joseph is needy and I am impoverished. And the congregation responded with their refrain, Glory be to you, my Lord, and through you to the Father on the day of your nativity. Repeatedly in Ephraim's hymns, Mary's voice sings of her suffering as a poor, unwed mother from a lowly backwater town, a woman scorned, ridiculed, and reviled. Here's number five on your sheet. Behold, I am slandered and oppressed, but I rejoice. My ears are full of scorn and disdain, but it is a small matter to me how much I shall endure, for a single word of consolation from you is able to chase away myriads of grief. By such characterizations, Ephraim turned his congregation's eyes to consider the, their own civic community, to their own poor and suffering and downtrodden among them. Sung by women's choirs, the images shimmered into bright view. These voices turned the attention of the worshiping community to the voices of those they did not or would not hear in their ordinary lives. Moreover, liturgy provided a particular space, a specific location for these voices. Its ritual defined a context of divinely sanctioned authority by which to sound and to hear these voices, an authority that stood outside of, yet in relation to the context of secular or ordinary life because you heard it in church. You heard it differently than if you heard it on the street. Jacob of Sarug is the other poet I will quote, and at the top of your uh, handout, Jacob of Sarug was a bishop who lived, he died in the year 521. This, it says on your handout, St. Ephraim is called in Syriac tradition the harp of the Holy Spirit, and Jacob of Sarug is called the flute of the Holy We have a divine orchestra in Syriac saints. So Jacob was a Syriac theologian whose liturgical poetry lifted Ephraim's model of liturgical voices to the highest level of theological reflection. In verse homilies that he intoned or chanted, he sang, he sang his homilies, Jacob preached at length about the women's choirs and why they mattered. Jacob declared that whereas Eve's disobedience had closed the mouths of women, Mary's obedient consent allowed them to be opened. According to Jacob, it was St. Ephraim himself who had founded women's choirs. And, quote, behold, the gatherings of glorious churches resound with their melodies. Just as Moses had led the Hebrew women in song at their deliverance from Egypt at the Red Sea, Ephraim led the Christian women to, and I quote, sing praises with their hymns, or, quote, with sweet melodies and joyful sounds for the deliverance from sin and death through baptism. Fittingly, Jacob argued that the power, he argued the power of the sacraments. I summarize here because Jacob's very long-winded, but he said, women should sing loud praise just as their men do because the sacraments gave proof of their equality. Women were baptized in the same font as the men. They partook of the same cup and the same Eucharistic bread. He imagined Ephraim calling out to the women, a single salvation was yours and your men. Why have you not learned to sing praise with a loud voice like they do? With dramatic force, Jacob addressed the women of the church. This is number six on your handout. This is an extraordinary passage. Until now, your gender was brought low because of Eve. But from now on, it is restored by Mary to sing Alleluia. Uncover your faces to sing praise without blame, without shame, to the one who granted you freedom of speech by his birth. Jacob, in fact, declared that women's choirs performed a sacred ministry of teaching, for the hymns that they sang were mandated in Syriac canon law, starting in the early 5th century, to be the doctrinal hymns of the church. These are called madrashe. It's a particular genre of hymns. 
not just psalms, but the doctrinal truths of the church. He marked the significance of this work with frank clarity. Addressing St. Ephraim for establishing the choirs, he sang, this is number seven, Our sisters were strengthened by you, O Ephraim, to give praise, for women were not allowed to speak in the church. Here he remembers uh, Paul's admonition in 1 Corinthians 14. Your instruction, St. Ephraim, opened the closed mouths of the daughters of Eve. And behold, the gatherings of the glorious church resound with their melodies. A new sight of women uttering the proclamation. And behold, they are called teachers among the congregations. Your teaching signifies an entirely new world. For yonder in the kingdom, men and women stand equal. According to Jacob, women's voices in the liturgy counteracted heresy, defeated Satan, converted pagans, and demonstrated the redemption, that redemption was God's promise for all people. And if you didn't hear women singing, you didn't know that. Their singing performed the very truth proclaimed by the content of their hymns. Hence, Jacob urged his congregation to pay heed to the hymns sung by the virgins with glorious voices that the wisdom of the Most High has given to us as a gift. Ephraim used to say, fill your ears with the sound of women. Isn't that great? In turn, Jacob called his congregation to sound forth their own voices in response. The congregation should call out their prayer, sing truthful hymns, call out the creed, join, uh, join the chant, cry out for forgiveness, beg for mercy. Raise their voice to God the Father. Jacob said, when you recite the creed, the walls of the church should shake from the thunder. All this, Jacob intoned, must be done out loud with boldness of speech and force of voice in the liturgy as it moved through its course. One must sing forth boldly and one must be heard to do so. One's voice in the liturgy must be heard. It must be heard by Satan, who will be diminished in shame. It must be heard by a city filled with heretics and slackers who will hear truth. It must be heard by the church who sing together with strength. And it must be hear heard by God who will hear one's devotion with mercy and compassion. It must be heard by one's own self to hear one's true identity. Hence, Jacob bestowed an authority on the lay voices that sounded forth in worship, analogous to that of the women's choirs. In his festal homilies especially, Jacob delights to present the biblical past, interlacing the liturgical present, as different biblical characters provided the types or models for how and why different segments of the human church community can all participate in the joyful singing of God's glorious and saving works. In one of his hymns on the nativities, Jacob presents it in this way. I summarize because it takes pages. Because a virgin conceived Christ, Jacob said, the choir of virgins can sing praise. Because Christ was born a baby cradled in the arms of his parents, babies in the arms of their parents are anointed and baptized at church. Because Mary was chosen from human women to be his mother, mothers and husbands can join the festivals. As Joseph, Mary, and the whole of creation sing because of the Christ child, so too all children, all pregnant mothers, all parents, all unmarried young virgins, can all rejoice in song. Adam and Eve, redeemed and restored, rejoice with the elderly because the Ancient of Days showed forth from Mary's son, in Mary's son. Pastors and flocks, churches, the gatherings of people and congregations from every insignificant mouth and every unworthy tongue all sing together, rejoicing and gladdened with God's glory. In such passages, Jacob identifies every member of the gathered church as crucial to and fully participant in the activity of liturgical celebration. The laity, 
themselves become included as ritual agents whose role is as necessary to the fulfillment of liturgical participation as those of ordained clergy and hierarchs. The, truth be the church becomes truly a priesthood of all believers. Liturgy in Jacob's instruction then was precisely the occasion of receiving voices and offering voices. Behold, all voices from all mouths are singing your praise, O Lord, he wrote. You are blessed by all, and to you praise from all tongues. For Jacob, the voices of liturgy were its effective meaning and its efficacious power. This is the last quote, number eight, on the handout. Voices upon voices crowd around Christ from every side. The voices of nations who clap their hands to give praise, and the voice of handmaids grouped in choirs to make a joyful noise. The voice of churches who sing praise with their harps, and the voice of monasteries who make a joyful noise to him with their alleluias. The voice of priests who consecrate him with the gentle waving of their hands, and the voice of saints who bless him in every place. The voice of men who sing praise with their tongues, the voice of women who exalt him with their hymns, the voice of children who repeat before him, the voice of teachers who set their knowledge in array before him. For praise of the Father, the Son awakens all creation. Such consideration decenters the authority of bishops or clergy. It recontextualizes the patriarchal ecclesiastical structure amid a broader and more richly textured communal body in which various authorities of different kinds are recognized articulated, exercised, and enabled. These were not rival authorities. The list of voices does not represent rivals or contests. They were not interchangeable. Rather, they were complementary, mutually constitutive, and mutually necessary, existing in relation to one another. Where have these sounding voices of liturgy brought us? At the end of the afternoon, <laughs> towards the end of this talk. For Ephraim and Jacob and for Syriac theologians, liturgy gave a voice to those who were often voiceless in our historical records, whether by gender, by age, by social rank, or status. This quality of liturgy was especially demonstrated by the prominent role of the Syriac women's choirs. a role highlighted when set together with biblical models that presented women's voices as powerful, meaningful, authoritative, and truthful. Voices singing and voices sung in liturgy, a context of sacred authority, divine presence, and majestic social meaning. Such clearly designated roles for women and laity in the liturgical life of the worshiping community whether in the choir or in the congregation, in all its ranks, suggest important theological ramifications regarding gender, authority, and ritual for the church as a larger community. The patriarchal authority of the male priestly hierarchy, for example, is significantly contextualized in such a situation. Liturgy is comprised of multiple voices, of multiple genders, each carrying affirmed authorities of different kinds. A mosaic, the manuscript illumination, we saw a mosaic, a mosaic of complementary authorities results rather than a rigid hierarchy of exclusive power. Each person is needed. Each voice is valued. In Ephraim, the Syrian and Jacob of, the Saru, and Jacob of Sarug, the sound of the church in rightly ordered song is the sound of creation in rightly ordered relation to God. In the sound of its women's choirs and the responses the congregation sang forth in reply, the church gave voice to a divine human relationship containing all, fulfilled in ringing harmony. No one was extraneous. Yet ritual performance presents a paradox, so I will leave you with a question. 
On the one hand, liturgy enabled these varied voices to be held in high relief, offering a degree of valuation for many rarely matched in the social and political realms of daily life. And liturgy also confined its voices, constraining their place and delimiting their proper expression. Proper expression. As Jacob of Saruk had remarked, men and women stood equal yonder in the kingdom, not here in worldly time or place. Ritually defined, these voices were also ritually constrained. Women's choirs sounded in the liturgy through designated choirs with voices not heard in public squares. Their names were never identified. These are completely anonymous choirs. The voices of biblical saints, the voices of the poor, the oppressed, and the needy were imagined in hymns and homilies, the overwhelming majority of which were composed by men, and often men of learning and men of status, not even recorded in the Bible itself. Liturgy empowered and liturgy marginalized. One could be heard and valued in this space and not in another. Yet even so, doesn't liturgy preserve the honor granted to the voice? Many of the voices I have mentioned briefly today are precisely those often missing from history as we know it, the voices of women, of children, of the poor, of the elderly. Yet the surviving sources leave no question and no ambiguity on this point. These voices were there. They were there in the church. They were heard and recognized in liturgy, if not beyond. Incised into the very breath of the gathered community, the sound of the church at worship was a sound that carried every person's life in its midst. Surely our work as those who study and think about such history, is to hear and to remember and to honor each voice and to ask how we will honor them now. Thank you. on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> this is bribery. Come on, George. There we go. All right. The token student. Thank you. Um, that's a good question. And if they told us who was exactly in the choirs, we might be able to answer it. Um, they were consecrated virgins. They could have been young. They could have been old. It's interesting that now, late in the 20th century, these choirs have undergone a, a, a revival, uh, especially among the diaspora community. Most, most Christians for whom Syriac is their language no longer can live in the Middle East. And so most live now in, in diaspora communities in Europe, in Scandinavia, in North America, in Rhode Island, Australia. Um, and late in the 20th century, there came a revival of the women's choirs. And um, since, I don't know, maybe around 2000, uh, there are annual choir contests in Sweden and in Germany. Every parish sends its, its girls, and they're girls. And, uh, the, you know, they can, who has the best girls' choir? It's kind of a cross between Eurovision Song Contest and American Idol. It's really kind of funny when you see it. Um, but how have they revived? One of the things they've done is to really uh, enhance the liturgical presence of these choirs. So if you, if you go into a Syriac liturgy, like if I'm at, oh, so how can we do this? So from your perspective, if you're the congregation, right? The altar is here. And on the right side of the altar, there's a choir of deacons. They stand right at the front. And on the other side, at the front also, will be your choir of young girls. And now they wear uh, robes of white, and they have a sash. 
Um, so this enhanced, and they lead the congregation in their hymns. And so this has dramatically enhanced their presence and your awareness, I mean, you see them, they're right there, they're at the front and they're leading you all. And the, the choir competition is very exciting. So they've, uh, they've highlighted this. We, we don't have unbroken records from the fourth century. I can produce records between the fourth and the 14th that mention these choirs. And then there's kind of silence. That it's not that they're not there, there just isn't any reference until the 20th century again. They, they would say they never lost this, but, but you know, they're noticing and appreciating. So now they're young, but in antiquity, I guess they would have been a mixture because once you were consecrated to it, you could stay in that service, maybe unless you married, not too likely. You probably just remained in that. It was like being a, there were women deacons still when these things began, <laughs> and uh, the women deacons were often the choir directors for these women's choirs. So it was a service you could perform for the church, um, and you could remain in that service for many years. But it's a good question. I wish we knew. So um, a really great question. And the women's choirs both sang the hymns that taught the doctrines of the church, and they also led the congregation in their responses and in the parts of the singing that the congregation performed. There's certain hymns that everybody sang together or certain things everybody said together, recited the Lord's Prayer, the Creed. Um, the what do you I always get these names mixed up in different churches, but the Sanctus, Holy, 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 the Trisagion, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth. Everyone sang that together. Um, so the congregation had many, and the congregation had to sing the Lord have mercy, and they had to sing the amens, and they had to sing the alleluias. There were lots of points. I guess I haven't been to Catholic Mass in a while. Yeah, in Orthodoxy, the entire service is sung. Almost nothing is spoken, almost every, except the sermon is spoken. The Lord's Prayer sometimes is spoken rather than sung, but everything is sung. So the congregation's singing all the time because you're always having to respond to something. Um, it's really a dialogue. And so one of the things I think about noticing the choirs is one way to, th I, I think, um, kind of standard histories of the liturgy will talk about the importance of the bishop preaching. The bishop is here and the the laity are here. But what I'm trying to say, there's a lot going on in the liturgy. The bishop was here, fine. The deacons were here, the subdeacons, the, um, the deaconesses, the women's choir, the congregationists. I mean, there's all, this, there's all these people, and they all have a part. And there's a lot for the congregation to sing. And so when Jacob keeps mentioning the importance of having the mothers and their children there, and the importance of having widows there, the importance of having the married couples there, the fathers there, with their children. Children were, um, the time period I'm talking about, the men would have been on one side and the women on the other side of the church. And the women had the children with them. The mothers had the children. So this is actually a very busy part of the church. Because you had the kids and you had the moms. And the women's choir probably stood on that side. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot for the congregation to do. And that I didn't notice in my sources, the importance of the congregation singing until I began to look at the choirs and what the choirs were singing. And then, then you began to see all these voices are singing all the time. But if what you're focusing on is what the, what the sermon was or the um, consecration and the, the blessing of the sacraments, you're missing the, the larger... Uh, framework of the service in which those things take place. Now, Jacob talks about when he preached, the women were singing just before he preached and just after, and then they led the congregation in there. So he's framed. His voice is framed by the voices of others, and he's always drawing attention to those, including the married, including families. It's a good question. Isn't that cool? So this is a serious 
question. And um, it really does seem to be something unique in the Syriac church now at the same time. So in the interest of not being here until, you know, three months from now, I had to omit a lot of history here. <laughs> but what happens is, in terms of choirs, in the fourth, up until the fourth century, so the first 300 years of Christianity, largely you have congregations and congregational singing because they're small. Churches are small. They're illegal. They're kind of underground. And everybody sings. Congregational singing is what the New Testament describes. In the fourth century, Christianity is legalized in the Roman Empire. And it gets a lot of money fast because the emperors convert. So huge cathedrals and big elaborate liturgies with vestments and big, well, so this, it's in the fourth century that you get professional choirs for the first time, trained choirs, and you get professional uh, chanters, singers. And we have our grave inscriptions, you know, Gaius of the honey-throated voice <laughs> who thrilled us all with his hymns. So in the fourth century, you begin to get choirs, and that's separate from the congregation congregation used to sing everything. So there's a new kind of hymn. This is the moment. We have it in Latin with St. Ambrose of Milan, uh, and you have it in Greek with a whole bunch of people, um, and you have it in Syriac with St. Ephraim, and that is the moment where you get verses with refrains. This is a technological innovation. If you have a short verse for the choir to sing, you have a refrain, everyone can sing, you can keep the congregation involved. But it's a big moment of change. And in the Greek and the Latin churches, the choirs, the trained choirs and the chanters are men. <laughs> but there's nothing that's officially said about this. And the way that liturgical history is often written and older, um, thinking of people like Quaston, Johannes Quaston, an earlier scholar of the 20th century, he says the fourth century is when women stop singing. Even though he knew the Syriac evidence, he says, well, the Syriac churches, they sang, but, you know, the Syriac churches are different. I'm like, well, it counts, doesn't it? You know, it counts. The thing is, as far as I can tell, in the Syriac churches, it goes, not only do they have women's choirs, but by early in the 5th century, maybe by the year 400, it turns up in Syriac canon law, and it stays in Syriac canon law, that every village, town, and city, church, must have a women's choir. And... What I find in the Greek sources, the deeper I dig, and the Latin sources, is that there were choirs of women. There were choirs of nuns. Ambrose had choirs of nuns. Um, but they're identified as choirs of nuns, and they're identified as singing psalms rather than these doctrinal hymns that were important in Syriac. And the other thing is the sources identify them as singing not in the daily services or every Sunday Mass, but it's special services, like if a bishop died, or if relics were brought to the city, or it's Easter. Egeria travels to Jerusalem and sees the Easter liturgy, and there's a women's choir there. I actually think that the sources show us a lot of singing by choirs of nuns in Greek and Latin churches, but it is not identified in canon law. And therefore, it's often not included in the history books. It is included in Syriac canon law, and so it's a, it's a, it exists in a different way. But it does seem a distinctive thing. And I often wonder, because you know, it was a very multi, multilingual world that, that these Christians were in. So was there a Greek church on this side of the street, and there's a Syriac one on this side of the street, and on this side of the street, the women's choir sang, and on that side of the street, they didn't? I mean, I, it's hard to quite get one's head around how the um, local community uh, accommodated, but uh, you know, I attend a church in Pawtucket where a part of our liturgy every week is in Arabic. And, you know, we sing. We sing whether we know the Arabic or not. Uh, we sing in English, and down the street there's a Catholic church meeting. You know, their mass is going on, and across the way there's a Chinese church at the same time. And, you know, we're all kind of in our languages. So I th we do it now. I guess they could have done it then. Yes, we've lost the music. Yeah.
And a lot of churches, yeah. Ah, uh, yes. I had a clip. I had a sound clip. There's a lot on YouTube now. The actual music of St. Ephraim or St. Jacob's time, we've lost. Yeah, well, you know, if you Google Syriac music on, on YouTube. Yeah. Sure. Um, it is. There's also a Syrian Orthodox parish in uh, Central Falls, St. Ephraim's, uh, and they have other uh, choirs. They have sometimes a really wonderful choir. It's a mixed choir of men and women. Um, but there is a lot now on YouTube. It, it is an interesting, so the, this particular music was lost um, in the same way that we don't sing, uh, you don't sing the hymns of St. Ambrose in the same tunes. You know, those tunes have been lost, but we still have some very ancient ones. Um, Syriac, like Greek, I don't know if, if you follow um, Byzantine hymnography is going through a big revival right now, too. And the, the way of notation, the way of writing the notes is different. So if you've been trained to read music uh, in Western notation, if you looked at Byzantine music, you wouldn't recognize what the notes were because it's, it's not written that way. Um, Syriac had no notation until maybe 40 years ago. Some, it was all taught by oral tradition. And some uh, Western scholars, especially Catholic scholars, uh, early in the 20th century, attempted to transcribe some of the melodies into Western notation, which also kind of changes the way they sound, because the scale's different. It's not the Greek scale, it's not the Arabic scale, it's not the Western scale, it's its own scale. Um, now, because of being in diaspora, um, many Syriac musicians have started, they've, they're now writing or trying to write their traditional music, their chants in um, Western notation, and they're recording them. And uh, as I say, we have a lot of choirs now on, on YouTube. I should have, I, I'm, I'm sorry, because I should have brought, uh, there are some very beautiful examples, and you can, he you can hear the men's and women's choirs echoing each other di dialogically, they're nice. Um, so they are, are uh, bringing their music into a more public, um, forum. But it's interesting to watch them struggle. The cops are doing the same thing, struggle with trying to get into a system of writing what the music is, because uh, it doesn't fit. Actually, I should make a note. This one. The deacon sang. Well, it, this is an interesting question. The deacons sang the Alleluias, and the women's choirs sang the verses that had the doctrinal instruction in them. That's an interesting difference. The women presented the teachings of the church, and the men did the Alleluias that uh, sort of confirmed it. But which, interestingly, in a sense, grants a higher authority to the women's choirs because they're the ones teaching the content. The men are just were just responding. But there was one particular kind of hymn, I didn't have time to talk about this, that this was one of the favorites uh, for Syriac writers. It's called, they're called dialogue hymns, they're called Sogito. Um, and these are hymns, we actually track back 4,000 years in the Middle East, at their, their, uh, their contests between two speakers. And in their Christian form, which begins in the fourth century, you tell a story between two biblical characters. So you need two choirs to do it. So you have the Archangel Gabriel and you have the Virgin Mary at the Annunciation. You have the boys choir singing Gabriel and the women's choir singing Mary. You need a verse for every letter of the alphabet. And you need a refrain. The congregation gets to sing the refrain 24 times or how many times there are. So Gabriel says, Mary, I've come to tell you a great thing is going to happen to you. Mary says, I don't know who you are. I don't want to hear about it. Gabriel says, no, I come bringing you something from God. Mary says, my mother Eve listened to a visitor she didn't know. I'm not making the same mistake. Gabriel says, but I told God I would bring you this message. Mary says, no. I mean, you, and they fight, you know, for 24 verses until finally Mary says, okay. 
I mean, but you don't know. You, know, you keep thinking, is she going to say yes or not? <laughs> you know. Then we have uh, Mary with Joseph, in which Joseph is saying, to, so again, we need a boys' choir, we need a girls' choir. You, Joseph is saying, I know how women get pregnant. And Mary's saying, no, you have it wrong. And these are quite, they can be quite powerful. Joseph says to her, woman, be silent. She says, I will not be silent. And they have to, you know, battle it out until somewhere around verse 48, because they each get 24 verses. Finally, he says, okay. Or we, ha we have many of these. We have um, the thief on the cross. Remember me, O Lord, in your kingdom. The thief, penitent thief on the cross arriving at the gates of paradise and the cherub the cherubim the, with the flaming sword won't let him in you know jesus said today i will meet you in paradise so the penitent thief arrives at the door of paradise and the cherub is there with his flaming sword and says i'm not letting you in you know who are you and the thief says no i've got to so you need two choirs to battle out uh until finally the cherub will let the thief in so we have we have a oh, we have quite a number of these we have 50 or 60 that are extant from the early church. Um, they tell biblical stories. They're wonderful. They involve almost no narrative. They inv it's all done by dialogue. And so you need a boys' choir, you need a girls' choir to sing the parts. And it, so the line with uh, drama, you know, between liturgy and drama is very close in these. And uh, some, some of them are very humorous, and, and some of them are just lacerating in their... their uh, poignancy but it's nice because it gave a role to everybody and the the syriac is very simple in these so you can imagine the the congregation really joining kind of like folk songs joining in with them so different forms of hymn singing that would require different kinds of choirs thank you